continuing with my mining stock education lectures, going to be talking about producing mining companies. Producing mining companies offer enormous leverage to a higher gold or silver price or copper price, depending upon what commodity the company is the primary producer of. They also offer a lot of downside leverage. If the commodity price is falling, if the management team screws things up somehow, there, and there's tons and tons of different ways that that could happen. There's a lot of different risks that the average retail investor does not understand at all. They do not even do the basic levels of research, unfortunately. So hopefully you watch the lecture on understanding risk versus reward. So before you buy, and this is not financial advice, but my opinion, but before anyone goes out and buys an individual mining stock, if you plan on holding it for more than just a short-term trade, you have to do a minimum amount of research in an individual mining stock. You either have to do it on your own, and you have to analyze risk versus reward, and you have to try to figure out what the geopolitical risk is. With the mines the company owns that are producing or being constructed, you have to figure out the management risk. Is the management good at building mines? Are they good at building certain types of mines? Are they not good at building certain types of mines? Do they have a track record like Hecla's management has lately of messing things up? Or do they have a, tra a good track record like the management of Pan American Silver of we normally don't hear problems? with production problems at the mines at Pan American Silver. It doesn't mean there's not problems. It means management normally solves them pretty damn quickly. And it means they don't fester to the point where the balance sheet of the company is in trouble. So you have to look, you have to, again, not financial advice, but if you're going to do basic due diligence for a mining company before buying individual mining shares and you're planning on holding it for part of the cycle, maybe two or three years, trying to get those hundreds of percent returns, that big upside, the gold price is at 1427. Last time I looked on today, July 2nd, if the gold price you know, goes to certain levels, does the company have a good balance sheet? Okay, Is it not over leveraged with debt? Do they have good margins? You would uh, look on the income statement for the margins. You would compare the margins to other mining companies on a relative basis to see. Okay, so on their checklist in your framework of risk versus reward, are you looking at the track record of management? Do they have, does management have a history not only of building mines and building certain types of mines and getting them on time and on budget, but does man can management navigate the geopolitical problems? Does management also have problems allocating capital? Some There's been some good management teams that have made problem, uh, enormous misallocations of capital. It can happen to even the best management teams where it all it takes with a producing mining company is really one bad mine, where the mine is overpaid for, the mine does not come in on time and on budget, there's a screw up with the capex or a screw up in the project economics of the mine and brent cook who is a geologist for 30 plus years he has talked about this in his speeches i linked you guys to this in my last lecture about the juniors brent cook and i highly recommend going and watching the speeches and presentations brent cook does because he has photographs he goes through the 3d mapping and the problems and or lies sometimes with the preliminary economic assessments or PEAs, how they're nowhere near accurate, the problems with the pre-feasibility studies. Normally the feasibility study is the most accurate, but sometimes it's not even that accurate. So there's a lot of things that can go wrong at the mine. And one of the examples that Brent Cook made was, this was many years ago, Sandstorm Gold made an investment into a junior miner called Luna Gold. And on the project economics with the feasibility study, it had a really profitable open pit gold mine in Brazil. And unfortunately, there was there was some problems with the open pit mine and the economics were not quite the way they thought they were. So at a higher gold price, the mine was making a lot of money, but when the gold price was going down, that's why the Arizona mine initially years ago got in trouble because this was a little junior holding the asset, not a mid-tier miner that's backed by Ross Beatty now when in Equinox Gold. And Ross Beatty hired a competent CEO and Ross Beatty has built many mines. You know, he's the chairman of the board. So I trust Ross Beatty a lot more than, you know, a small little junior producer. But the point was, Brent Cook was saying how, you know, the, the 3D mapping and modeling and the project economics and the feasibility study were all making certain assumptions about how the mine was going to be mined on the open pit. And then when they started actually like mining the 
the reality versus the assumptions in the 3D mapping and modeling was not 100% accurate. There was like a 10 or 20% variance and that hurt the project economics. And some of these mines can be marginal, especially when the gold price is not rising. So once the capital is committed, if the mine, if the metals price is falling or it goes sideways and metals price doesn't rise, you have to look at the assumptions for the metals price in the feasibility study and some of these other studies. And then also with their resource estimates, like an NI43101, sometimes these companies tries to try to move something past. So if you're not going to do the research of an individual uh, mining company on your own, if you're not going to spend at least, I would say, two hours looking at risk versus reward, trying to figure out the geopolitical situation, trying to figure out the track record of management, trying to figure out you know any operational problems, maybe go through the annual reports, go through um, some of the other technical reports that the company has released on their website about a specific mine that they're building. If there's a surprise CapEx increase that could happen three years from now, and if the mine is not profitable, the mining company is gonna have to go back to the market and there's gonna be massive share dilution or the miner's balance sheet is already stressed, the miner may have to sell the mine for pennies on the dollar, or the miner could be in many uh, very serious problems, bankruptcy risk. So if you're not going to do that type of research on an individual mining company, either number one, you should not, again, not financial advice, just my opinion, you should not own individual mining company shares, or you should buy mining company ETFs, mining company ETFs, or you should stick with Royalty and streaming companies or a combination of those things of mining stock ETFs, royalty and streaming companies, maybe a gold stock mutual fund that actually has geologists on staff. The other, the other thing that you can do is newsletter writers. And as I stated in my lecture on junior miners, you have to be very careful with paid newsletter writers because a lot of these guys, way they puff up and lie about their reputation. Unfortunately, this is just how the industry works. It is sizzle above stake to sell a newsletter. There are tons of newsletter writers. There's a couple I'm thinking about in particular that one of them has had two good calls in the last 30 or 35 years. I think two good calls. And he grosses over $10 million per year in sales and just sold his paid newsletter to Stansbury Research in the last couple of years for a massive profit. He cashed out. But the guy has an absolutely horrible track record. You know who he is. He's been predicting gold price to go down every single month to $600 an ounce or $700 an ounce or less. I have friends who have taken off um, in bets with him who have made, who have won one ounce gold coins from him because he, his ego is hubris. And yet he still has tons of paid subscribers. And on top of that, not just the hubris and lying about the track record and all marketing sizzle above stake, predatory marketing. And the company I worked at in the newsletter industry, we they would have marketing meetings and I would sit, on, sit in on them on how to copy Agora Financial, how to copy Stansbury. So Stansbury and Agora have really good marketing. Okay, they're good at what they do. I would say it's predatory marketing, but they make a lot of money doing it. There's a reason their companies are worth over a billion, um, the total combined Stansbury and Agora Financial worth over a billion dollars. And it's because they have, I think, over 100 newsletters making at least a couple million bucks each. Some of them more than that. So they, it's, it's just crazy. But with the junior minor, uh, excuse me, with the paid newsletter writers, and I talked about this on the Junior Explorers lecture. The paid newsletter writers, they lie, some of them lie about their track record a lot, so you have to try to look up and verify track records. Some of them have like a trial period where you can try out their newsletter for a little bit, but some of these guys, you don't know if they could, normally it's with juniors, from my experience, is with juniors where the paid newsletter writer is getting like some type of like warrants or some type of payoff. Normally it's with a junior. It, I haven't really heard many examples. I can't really think of one off the top of my head where a large producing mining company was paying the paid newsletter writer to pump the stock. There may have been there may have been one, but I'm not fully sure about that. But it's it was pervasive when capital was easy and gold prices were much higher until the 2012 to 2015 period when gold prices were falling. By 2015, a lot of the waste that was the juniors spending enormous amounts of money on marketing to newsletter writers that and trips and all that stuff that's gone but still 
these newsletter writers, a lot of them do not have, even though they might sound smart, a lot of them might not be good at picking out mining stocks. They might not understand valuations. They might be too lazy to do all the research required. You have to keep up with these things a lot because a lot can change very, very quickly with the mine. There could be a surprise CapEx bill at one of the mines and all of the sudden or the miners costs go out of whack or there's flooding in a mine. I mean, I could just name the production problems at some of these mines. Uh, a mining union at one of the mines could go on strike. Hecla had this at Lucky Friday. There's been minor strikes in South Africa. There's minor strikes in different countries in South America, where even if the metals price is not necessarily rising, the mine, if in some cases the metals price is falling and the miner is in very close to bankruptcy, miner is a bad balance sheet, and you have the miners unions still demanding much higher wages. So they, I, and I've read interviews with some of these um, mining union people saying they don't care if the mining company is about to go bankrupt, they demand higher wages. Well, how, how's the miner going to pay? So why, why take the risk with mining stocks? The risk is that if you do the research or you find a really good paid newsletter writer, someone with a good track record who can, you can actually verify, and there's not many of them. There's a lot of people who claim to have the track record. The reality is there's not many. It's, it, I would say it's probably below 25% of all the newsletter writers who actually know, who actually have a good track record. Most of them just claim it. So they call bottoms routinely and they lie about their track record. They obfuscate. But if you know what you're doing in mining stocks or you find the right newsletter writer, you can get those 80% returns, those 100% returns, those 200, 300, 400, 500, maybe even 600% returns. And how do you do that? So... The gold price doesn't necessarily have to go up a lot for you to do well in a mining stock, and I'll explain why. So mining companies are valued. We got a question um, in another live stream. We got a question about valuation, how to value gold miners. So there's a couple different ways. There's the in situ, and I have five articles on this that go more in depth and technical, so I'm not going to read every single part of the article. I will read parts of them for right now if you want me to. I'll read Okay, so in mining, um, one of the best, the best valuation is net asset value is essentially a discounted cash flow of a mine's cash flows or the net value of the asset. Of course, it is more difficult in practice than in theory to actually do that because with a mine, there's depletion. So the only reasonable way to evaluate a mining company is to look at the net present value of the potential future cash flow discounted at an appropriate discount rate. You have to take into account not just the cash flow that the mines are generating, but also sustaining capital costs. And this is what gets you in trouble with mines over other businesses, is the maintenance capex or capital expenditure. Because with a mine, there's so many moving, moving parts. A crusher could break down. Um, the mill, part of the mill needs to be upgraded. Or these mines often have, as in the picture there, they have these big trucks moving the, trucking the ore to the crusher. And then, so it gets grinded down to a pulp. There's all these details that I could go into. But the bottom line is there's hundreds, if not thousands of moving parts in a mine. There's property plant and equipment that ha routinely has to be fixed or breaks down. The mine has to run at 24 seven, 365 to, so there's late night crews, there's overnight crews and there's day crews. And the mine has to be continually producing cash flow. So you have to take into account not just the cash flow, but also sustaining capital costs, including future exploration and development costs associated with keeping the mine in production assuming you can derive a sustainable cash flow model for each mine that a company owns you can then calculate the net present value of future cash flow by using an appropriate discount rate to represent the geological political social and financial risks if you sum all the net present values together add any other assets on the balance sheet and subtract any debt you'll arrive you will excuse me you will arrive at the net asset value per share in a rational world, you would expect to pay no more for a mining stock than its net asset value per share. But some of these companies get a re-rating. Their valuation multiple can increase. So some of these companies are trading at severe discounts to net asset value. I'll give you an example. So we have here, and this is not a gold mining company. Well, gold is a byproduct. So you have Turquoise Hill. So Turquoise Hill is on the Toronto Stock Exchange. Sim and also on the NASDAQ, New York Stock Exchange and NASDAQ, it says on the website here, TRQ, 
Tommy Rachel QWERTY, as in your keyboard. And the stock is down to like a dollar or something now. It's down to $1.69 per share. It used to be a, five, a 4 or $5 stock. And that is because they've had enormous production problems. They own this absolutely a large share of this absolutely massive copper and gold mine in Mongolia. There's geopolitical risk there. There's operational executional risk. And there's balance sheet risk. So... $5 billion, which is an enormous sum of money, is being invested into the underground portion of the Oyu Tolgoi mine in Mongolia. But there's been a lot of construction delays building out the underground part. So the open pit part of that mine is doing very, very well. It's been running for a long time. But the stock is discounted not only because the copper price has had a correction, but also the mi the mining company has had operational problems getting the underground portion. It's not on time and on budget, and that's going to put stress on the balance sheet. So right now, that is selling. Nolan Watson of Sandstorm Gold did a podcast interview about a month ago, and someone asked him on the podcast interview about a mining company that's selling for an enormous discount, and he said that Turquoise Hill is selling at 0.2 of its net asset value. So it's selling at an enormous discount to its net asset value. He said that it's probably the cheapest discount to net asset value right now. So if the management team can execute and things start to go well, they will produce more cash flow underground and the stock will be re-rated. They will get a higher multiple. It, the discount to net asset value will decrease. So right now, it's like an 80% discount to net asset value. It's only at 0.2 NOV net asset value. So if things start to improve at the company, it could start to, that discount will start to go away. Or Turquoise Hill gets bought, which is probably not financial advice, but probably more likely they get bought at maybe some type of premium because they do have, this is one of the world's largest and best copper and gold mines. It's one of the five largest copper mines with an enormous amount of gold byproduct on the planet. And there are geologists out there, I've read some reports and articles from them, that think that this copper mine underground portion in Mongolia, the Oyo Tolgoi, it will run for over 70 years. Some think over 100, but that's, that might be too optimistic. Obviously, a lot of people don't have a 100-year time frame. So what else for valuations? The other valuations, the net asset value seems to be the main, most respect one in the industry. The other ones are in situ, which is valuing reserves. But the mining industry tends to not value resource or reserves because the cost of the mine can change. And just because a junior has... 4 million ounces of gold, 5 million ounces of gold does not mean it's a great project. It could be very uneconomic. So the project economics that have could that could have been released, the preliminary economic assessment or the pre-feasibility, it could be assuming $1,500 or $1,600 gold. So the margins might not be good. Or the mine is out in the middle of nowhere in Canada, or it's in a jungle somewhere, I don't know, it's in a jungle somewhere in Africa or in a jungle somewhere in South America. And the CapEx... To, to build the infrastructure for the power plant, the roads. Um, you have to have housing or at least some type of housing and schools and, and electricity for, so for your employees so they can have families there. And then the electricity so you can do the mining and run the mill. You know, all these things, if the electricity and the infrastructure with the roads and all that's the, the stuff is not there, you're looking at hundreds of millions of dollars, if not more, in extra capital expenditure to build a mine, which hurts the economics of the mine. Okay, so we have an, an, another couple examples here, and these are two companies that they're not producing yet, but if they execute with their management, one of the mines is already under construction, well underway. It's almost 80% done. That is the Fruta del Norte mine in Ecuador by Lundin Gold. They bought the asset for a big discount from, I think, Kinross after Kinross overpaid for it. It is a very high-grade asset. It is not The property has not been drilled a lot yet. So they have like about 10 or 11 years of reserves right now. But as And this is the upside of a mining company. So if the mining company builds the mine and management team executes on time and on budget and there's not big cost overruns that hurt the project that hurt the project economics of the mine or put the balance sheet of the miner in jeopardy then you have a situation where 
the mine's going to have good project economics. It's going to have good margins at the current gold price, and its margins are going to expand. The gold price goes up, but also, the well, first, the stock would get re-rated. So Lundin Gold could go, this is not financial advice, but Lundin Gold on the Toronto Stock Exchange LUG, L-U-G, is at $6.67 a share. If the management team executes and they start producing gold economically without too many production problems with a good margin, you could see that stock get re-rated with a much higher net asset value multiple. You could start to see a lot higher multiples on there. The stock would get re-rated. The other thing that is good for a mining share investor that can happen is exploration upside. Okay, So once the mining company starts to make a uh, profitable starts to become excuse me generates uh declares e commercial production at the mine and hopefully maintains it they can take operating cash flow i had a little brain fart there a minute ago they can take i've been talking for god no let me see how many minutes i've been talking for i've been talking for 21 minutes straight with no water break so once the mining company obtains um economic or commercial production they can take that operating cash flow, and remember, they only have 10 years of reserves for now, and the enemy of the mining company is deple is depletion. So they have to find, they either have to find new gold around the mine, or they, the mining company has to go buy a new gold mine, or a new copper mine, depending upon what type of commodity they're mining. If they want to maintain the multiple the market is giving them, and they want to maintain their production rating. If they're paying a dividend too, so then they have to maintain their revenues. They can't let their revenue slip and keep paying a dividend, or if they have debt on their balance sheet, they can't let their revenues fall. So once the mining company gets a commercial or economic production, that operating cash flow will then be, re hopefully it will be, reinvested into exploration. And this is where, with a mine like Fruta del Norte, Keith Barron was the geologist who found it. And uh, if you're not familiar with Keith Barron, look him up, look up his track record. He's considered one of the best economic geologists in the last three or four decades. He's found a lot of big mines. And he thinks that there will be massive exploration upside at Fruta del Norte, which is in Ecuador. They have an enormous land package. And so Lundin Gold is hoping that as the mine gets starts generating profit, they will reinvest that into more drilling and they will find even more reserves, resource, and they will drill that into reserves. They may even find additional mines there and that could turn into a district. They have a very, very large land package and that is a very high grade gold deposit. Although their mill is small, but eventually they can, if they find enough gold, they can always reinvest profits back into expanding the size of their mill. The other thing here is Sandstorm Gold, unlike the mining companies, which have to have economic production there and have to reinvest operating cash flows into exploration drilling, Sandstorm Gold rides along for free because it has a royalty on Fruta del Norte. So Sandstorm Gold is not required to contribute any additional capital there. This is why I like the business model. So Lundin Gold will hopefully, the business model for royalty and streaming companies, once the company gets to a certain size. So Lundin Gold will hopefully make a profit, reinvest that back into the mine, uh, around the mine in drilling, and they will find a lot more gold. And exploration upside is not necessarily priced massively into the stock initially, but in an increase in reserves or an increase in the mine life, say from 10 years to 20 or 30 years, doesn't necessarily get immediately priced into the stock, but it means that the mining company is going to have more projectable cash flows for many more years. And that could potentially allow, once the people running the mining company say, hey, now we have 30 years of reserves, we have a solid mine, we can start a dividend soon. So with that exploration upside comes more future, uh, reliable future cash flows with grades and stuff. And this is why Kirkland Lake has had so much success at Fosterville. Okay, that enormous exploration success with Kirkland Lake has really given them a leg up. Another company that could get re-rated is Mag Silver. That's M-A-G. Mike, Alex, Greg. That's at like ten dollars a share. Their their mine is not built yet. They're not a little junior that's betting the whole company building this mine. But one of the the largest primary silver miner in the world, Fresnillo in Mexico, is their partner, and Fresnillo is building the mine. They still have to contribute capital, but. The mine has started construction immediately, and the construction is expected to be completed by the end of 2020. Maybe, maybe it goes into 2021. But as the mine comes online, and this is some of the highest grade, lowest cost 
primary silver mine. This might be the highest grade and lowest cost primary silver mine in the world. This has like $10 an ounce, all in sustaining costs. It is 400 grams per ton silver. It's the, the economics on it are just outstanding. And I've watched presentations from the CEO, Mag Silver. He's a geologist who I think found the, found the property initially by drilling. And he personally thinks, and again, not financial advice, just his opinion. He thinks that there could be a billion ounces of silver at this mine and that the mine could run for maybe even over 100 years. So my point, though, talking about this company is right now it's at $10 per share. Well, as the mine gets built and the mine achieves commercial production, you're looking then at the upside for this stock of not only a higher silver price because silver is cheap right now with the gold to silver ratio being above 90, but you're also looking at a re-rating, a higher multiple on mag silver with the cash flow. Increased cash flow and a higher net asset value multiple. So the company would go from not generating positive cash flow to potentially maybe even paying a dividend once that mine is online in commercial production. And then of course they're hopefully going to reinvest some of those profits or positive cash flow into drilling the land and even more exploration upside. So the ways that you can make a lot of money from a producing mining company besides the metals price going up, because if the metals price goes high enough, it will lift all boats or almost all boats, unless the management team drastically screws things up or the miners very close to bankruptcy. But the two main ways that the mining stock can go up are like a re-rating evaluation multiple increase normally if there's a new mine brought online or a turnaround in a produce in an existing mine that was having problems. And the other way is exploration upside where a lot of new resource and then reserves have been drilled off and the mine goes from only having maybe the mine is down to five years of reserves left and all of a sudden there's and I think that was the case with Fosterville. I think Fosterville had a really shitty reserve base with their open pit, and they started drilling holes beneath the open pit, and they got really lucky. I mean, the odds of that, the odds of a Fosterville with that type of um, low-grade open pit that was being that was being mined initially in Australia, the odds are like even greater than one in a thousand. It might have been one in a million type of discovery. That's how good. And now Fosterville is the highest grade lowest cost gold mine in the world i think some of the some of the grades at fosterville are like 60 grams per ton and i think their average grades are i think they're around 30 now so i think i covered most of the stuff here the gold price has been rallying today I'm looking at listener questions and comments now. I think I covered pretty much everything, though. Oh, Pan American Silver. So we had a listener question um, about Pan American Silver. Again, this is not financial advice, just my opinion. I think right now, Pan American Silver is probably, along with Fresnia, which is on the London Stock Exchange, if you stupidly buy an over-the-counter stock for a Fresnia, the over-the-counter stocks are very illiquid. They might be convenient, they might be easier, but you're running a big risk. The spreads between bid and ask on buying an over-the-counter stock in an illiquid market like that are very risky. Interactive brokers should have setups there for London Stock Exchange. But um, Pan American Silver is a very safe primary silver miner. I think they're probably the safest, in my opinion, for primary silver miners. The upside for Pan American Silver, if they get a re-rating or the silver price starts to go higher, you're looking at potentially a minimum two or three bagger. So if the silver price goes to, let's say, 20, if the silver price goes from 15 to 20, you're potentially, or 22 or 23, you're potentially looking at a double, maybe even a triple. And this is not financial advice, just my opinion. Pan American Silver has really good assets. They have a couple really good mines that are ready to come online after the silver price rises. And they're still, I think, making a good amount of money on their gold, but not really too much, more than a dollar or so, or two, $2 on their silver. So bottom line, there is a ton of moving parts in a producing mining company. You're taking, for those of you who are not aware, if you buy individual mining stocks and planning on buying and holding, you're going to be holding, taking an enormous amount of risk that you may not understand, and there's a lot of different risks. 
There's tons of operational risks at a mining company because of all the moving parts at the mine. There's geopolitical risk that you might un not understand. There's management risk. There's a lot of management risk. There's a ton, and this is an unfortunate thing about the industry. I think gold mining CEOs are the worst group of CEOs probably in any industry right now. It's just really sad. A lot of them are lazy and dishonest. And that includes junior, junior mining CEOs. Not all of them, but unfortunately a lot of them are lazy or inept or dishonest. Yeah, Fosterville really hit it big. No, they're trying to cap gold for now. It will eventually go to a bull market. Silver will have to rise. If silver doesn't go higher in the next couple of years, the miners are going to, a lot of the higher cost miners, they're out of ways to, 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 to repair their balance sheet. The, mine, the, the higher cost bad balance sheet silver miners are already on the brink. I'm really surprised Hecla has not done a big capital raise yet. Probably less than, if my educated guess is less than six months. Hive blockchain mining. On paper, their business plan looks good. I haven't looked at the company recently, so I can't comment. So it's not financial advice. I haven't looked at the company recently. On paper, their business plan looks good. You know, a lot of these miners, guys, on paper, their business plan looks good for the mine. But then there's problems at the mine. The mine does not come in. They make a big investment into a new mine or they upgrade a mine. And the mine does not come in on time and on budget. And then you get into a situation where Yamana Gold has to do a 180. There's another case study. I talked about this a lot already. Yamana Gold has to do a 180, pisses off shareholders, sells their best uh, margin, lowest cost, mar um, lowest cost mine, producing mine, Chapada, to Lundin Mining. And Lundin Mining now, they paid a billion dollars, but the upside for Lundin Mining, and they're a copper miner, but the upside, I've taken a look at some of the the technical reports for Chapada and the exploration results, it looks like the Chapada mine is going to be, if Lundin Mining invests the couple, like 200 something million dollars into the upgrades, the economics at the mine are going to improve a lot. And then on top of that, there's just absolutely enormous exploration upside. There's absolutely enormous exploration upside for Lundin Mining at the Chapada mine, the copper and gold mine. It looks to me... Like there's potentially two new deposits around Chapada that either can be mined separately or can be trucked to the mill. So, and Yamana Gold, when they sold Chapada to Lundin Mining, they kept a royalty on the highest grade drill results on next to Chapada Mine. So I would watch for that. I forgot the name. I don't have the, the uh, press release up here, but that looks really attractive for right now because they already have the mill there and it is a really low cost copper and gold mine and they just found looks like a couple new deposits right right around the mine that can be trucked there so if you're a mining company you wouldn't want to sell your best asset that had your best margins so that that to me would show management risk and that's why that's why because of their balance sheet and management that's why yamana gold's not selling in a great multiple the stock has rallied lately, but in general, for a long time now, Yamana Gold shares have been depressed. And that's because the, and it's gotten even worse lately because of the Chapada sale, but management just doesn't, the market, excuse me, does not trust management. Wow, that's interesting. Yamana Gold CEO won some award being a great manager a decade or so ago. Well, the gold price was rising a decade or so ago. It's a lot easier to run a gold company when the gold prices are start are going up every couple of years. A lot easier. It's the old Warren Buffett saying, right, that you find out who's swimming naked when the tide goes out. And this is the case with the gold mining CEO industry. Um, I don't know Sabanya Gold offhand. Equinox, I think they're doing a good job with the... Arizona mine in Brazil, there's a lot of exploration upside there. They just increased the the mine life, the reserves for the open pit, and it looks like there's an underground mine potentially there too. So that could run for another 20 or 30 years. At I think the grades are even better underground than they are with the open pit. And there's a lot of exploration drilling they can do on the green fields. I don't um what worries me about Equinox is they're trying to put um a mine in California 
and they have the permits already and they started construction on it to reopen this California gold mine. But I'm always wary of trusting California politicians. Yeah, Equinox Gold is Ross Beatty, but I'm still, he's investing in California in a gold mine. I'm, I just don't trust California politicians. They could always change the rules or increase the taxes. Look what the Australian politicians are doing to Fosterville with that new 2.75% royalty. It's not going to kill the economics for Fosterville, but... Hey, New York City Bit, uh, thank you very much for the $50 super chat. $49.99, the QVC price. Thank you very much for the super chat donation. I appreciate it. So, I'm getting tired of talking. I will take a quick look, a, a quick look at the questions and comments in the live stream. If I don't get you, put the question or comment below the video after it's over, but I'm getting tired right now and I will make sure to attach all five articles about valuing mining stocks and how to calculate net asset value and why not to use some of the other valuation metrics um, in the information section of the video after it's over. Okay, Tim Ryder asks, is there a good junior ETF you would recommend? Appreciate all your shows and the time you spend on educating. Okay, so the mainstream junior stock gold mining ETF is a GDXJ, but it, there's not really juniors in there. The best junior gold mining ETF that I know of is a Sprott, is a Sprott junior gold miner one, and that's actually using a ton of... The methodology in there is very sophisticated. I forgot the exact methodology. I was I was up in Toronto headqu Sprott headquarters in Toronto, and they're explaining it. I think it uses... Oh, what's the what's the the type of math in finance? There's a very advanced level math. I for, they hired a bunch of PhD mathematicians to do to put the inputs there. It's uh, SGDJ, I believe. So Sprott Gold Miners SG. No, Sprott Gold, and then D and then J. There, I typed it for you. It's in the, it's in the live stream. Yeah, quants. Yeah. So they hired PhD Mathmax. Yeah, they hired quants, and they looked at it quantitatively. They went back and looked for um, back testing, how they found the best juniors. Yep, quants. Yeah. So um, if you're more curious about the methodology for that junior gold miners ETF, it'll be in the prospectus there. It'll be on the website and in the prospectus how they do the research. And it screens. And I believe the holdings for the juniors changes. It changes um, every quarter, I think. So it doesn't just stick with it. But there's the average retail investor, unfortunately, doesn't do the research. They don't do the research they should, minimum amount, for to buy an individual mining stock. Um, they watch a YouTube video, and it's normally marketing and bullshit, that where someone's paying, the mining company's paying for an advertisement, and they get suckered that way, or they trust the wrong paid newsletter writer. So those are some of the main mistakes most people make, unfortunately. I see it all the time on a daily basis. I get emails about this stuff, and I've heard this, tons of sad stories. So that's why I'm doing these lectures, and hopefully they're useful. For right now, I think this will be the last lecture because I think I covered pretty much all the main subsectors. I may occasionally do additional lectures where I update things, or I'll do like I'll spend an entire lecture maybe talking about an individual one or two case studies. If there's a management team that was doing really well, and then all of a sudden they screwed up the company with the balance sheet, and one mine almost bankrupted them. Um, for example, you know, what happened with New Gold and Rainy River, how that almost bankrupted the company and the CEO was fired. And I think a lot of the board of directors were also canned too. New Gold didn't go bankrupt, but it was close. And then, uh, Hecla. So Hecla hasn't gone bankrupt, but it's not looking good. They need to do a capital raise. Okay, guys, well, I'm getting pretty tired. We're at 39 minutes, almost 40 minutes. Um, there are a lot of mining stock questions coming in about specific companies. Dave Miller asks, first, mining gold has takeover potential sending valuation higher. That would be a speculative bet. It's not fun. This is not financial advice. That would be a speculative bet. I wouldn't make that bet. Let's just put it that way. 
Um, Endeavor Silver is not going to be generating free cash flow again. They have to make big CapEx investments into their producing mines already to get the cost back down. So they said that until Q3, so a couple months from now minimum, they won't have any profit again. Okay, I'm going to take a rest for now. We're at 40 minutes. I didn't get a water break yet. I'm going to go relax.